for a dialogue limited. And today I'm going to talk about tests, derivations, and proofs. Um, somehow, somehow my update to the uh, conference website on the title of the talk has not been uh, ex not been uh, put up. So this is incorrect. Uh, proofs, derivations, and tests. Okay. Um, John Hughes and Mary Sheeran, in their talk, Why Functional Programming Matters, listed four salient features of functional programming. And similarly, Ken Iverson, the inventor of APL, in his Turing lecture in 1980, notation as a two of thought, listed five important characteristics of notation. We, il we will illustrate these points using the language APL by showing some test uh, techniques, deriving program simplifications, and proving the correctness of some programs. These techniques are in daily use in real-world applications at Dialog. Assert APL utility function. Use in the dialogue QA suite. Okay. And the the details I won't the subtleties I won't explain. So as I said, um, the main thing about assert is the assert utility is that the conditions that I want to be true are stated in a positive sense. So for example, CO equals one plus e to the pi times zero j1. So we'll illustrate the use of this utility on the diamond kata. Uh, kata is a programming exercise used in the um, agile development, extreme programming, and test-driven development communities. The problem description here is uh, by Ron Jeffries of uh, TDD fame. Notice his use of the technical term whatever. <laughs> but. I mean, realistically, that's quite often how we receive specifications. It's stated like that. Okay, so the input would be a bunch of letters, and you're supposed to generate this diamond-shaped output. So here is the uh, solution in APL. I can't claim credit for uh, deriving this. Uh, Morton wrote this. Yeah, <laughs> remember that? <laughs> um, I won't try to explain the details here. The, uh, the details are in the uh, dialogue blog. Um, oh, by the, by the way, the um, the presentation will have a lot of uh, very fine details. Uh, don't worry if you if you can't uh, copy them all down, because the, 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 all the slides will be in in the uh, conference website. So I won't explain the details of this function, 
but uh, what we're going to do is to um, talk about testing solutions to the Diamond Carter. The APL function treats the uh, required construct as a matrix rather than as individual lines or even individual letters. This is the whole value idea of Hughes and uh, Sharon. Uh, and such a way of looking at the problem has its benefits as we now demonstrate. So DC is an operator or a higher order function which takes a function operand name alpha alpha whose argument omega are the input letters and then it computes a result which we name Z and we're going to apply a bunch of assertions on the, on the result. Ideally, um, the assertions would fully specify what a diamond Carter function does. That is, a function is a solution to the diamond Carter if and only if all the assertions are satisfied. Uh, another way of saying that is that the assertions should be a set of desiderata which leaves nothing more to be desired. Okay, um, I'll go through the assertions one by one. Now, n is the number of input letters. So the solution, z, should be a matrix of shape minus 1 plus, the, plus 2 times n. Unless you input zero letters, in which case the shape of the matrix should be 0, 0. Okay, and next, the solution should be symmetric in the vertical axis. So if you flip it left to right, it, sh it should uh, remain the same. And uh, similarly, the solution should be symmetric in the vertical axis, like if you flip it from top to bottom, it should be the same. And uh, I'm going to form Q, which is the upper right quadrant of the result matrix. And the diagonal in this upper right quadrant should be the input letters. And finally, in this quadrant, the off diagonal Entry should be the dash. So these uh, matrices in the boxes would fail to be a solution to the diamond Carter problem on each of the assertions. So this one is not a matrix of, uh, you see, what's four? Yeah, the shape, the shape would be wrong. Because if n is 4, it should be a 7 by 7. But here it's a 8 by 7. Yeah. Here it's, a, it's not uh, symmetric in the uh, vertical axis, because this is there. And here is not symmetric in the horizontal axis. Like if you flip this, it, it will be a different matrix. And here, the upper right quadrant would not be the input letters, which are A, B, C, and D. And here, in the upper right quadrant, the off diagonal entries are not all dashes.
So we can see um, um, from the example of the diamond cutter that tests are often descriptive rather than prescriptive, asserting what a result should be rather than how to compute it. And for that reason, they tend to be more robust and easier to write than the actual function. For example, um, it's much easier to test that R is a root of a polynomial than to derive the root in the first place. And uh, another example is that it's much easier to test that S is a solution to the NP-complete problem than to solve the NP-complete problem. And, and lastly, uh, if you can afford to have multiple development teams, one of the teams can be devoted to writing tests. Um, now, I'm, uh, I'm going to now relate a recent experience where testing has had a quite a beneficial effect on a long-standing problem. Um, I set out to write tests on, on the uh, transpose primitive in APL, uh, indicated by this symbol. So it worked the right argument, in this, in this uh, case, the matrix Y. So the right argument can be any array, and the left argument is a vector indicating the order that you take the axis in. So for example, one zero transpose of Y means first you take axis one, and then you take axis zero. And zero one transpose Y means you take axis first, take axis zero, and then take axis one. In this case, it would be the identity function. And finally, if you have repeated elements in the left argument, you get um, diagonal section. Or in, in other words, the axes are run together. Another way to look at transpose is that the left argument, in this case x, specifies the order in which you, um, let me get this correct, specify the order of the indices or subscripts that you need to obtain an item of the result. So for example, I have this uh, y is a, in this case is a five-dimensional array of random numbers, and I'm going to do this kind of transpose two one two zero one. Uh, the result happens to have uh, ranks three, or it's a three-dimensional result, which you can in index by i, j, and k, and to get that element. You, permute, you, you take the uh, indices in the order specified by the left argument. So, you know, if, if i is 0, j is 1, and k is 2, then 2, 1, 2, 0, 1 means you take k, j, k, i, j. All right? Another way to say the same thing without using the semicolons so that you can uh, have expressions that work on the arrays of any rank would be, you know, you index said by the n close of v, that should be the same as y indexed by v's index by x. Okay. Now, this second way of looking at transpose 
requires that you know the shape of the result. Which, um, from the description, you can derive the following computation for the shape of the result. You, you index, uh, sorry, you group the shape of y, which is rho of y, by shape, by sorted x. So you, you do 0 first, 0, get 3 from the shape, and 1, and 7, and 2, and then for 2, you get 11 and 5. So this is grouping the shape of y by sorted x. And then the shape of the result is the minimum in each group. So for 0, the minimum is 3, because that's the only thing there is. And for 1, it should be 2. And for 2, it should be 5. So lo and behold, the shape of uh, x transpose y is 3, 2, 5. So this is a computation for the shape of the result. It also means that the rank of the result is 1 plus the minimum, uh, sorry, 1 plus the maximum of x. So the maximum of x is 2, and the rank of the result is 1 plus that, which is 3. So this leads to the following tests on transpose. Uh, again, TC is an operator. It takes a operand function denoted by alpha alpha and uh, it's purported to be a transpose function and then we uh, apply assertions on the argument while we're at it, and then also assertions on the result. So the um, assertions on the arguments we call preconditions, and the assertions on the result we call postconditions. So let's go through these conditions one by one. So this says that the uh, left argument, alpha, should be a vector. And the length of the vector should be the same as the rank of uh, the right argument. And uh, the left argument should, be, uh, should not be negative. It should be greater than or equal to 0. And it should match the floor of it, which means it should be uh, integers. And so we take the maximum of the left argument, but at, le at, at least 0. Add 1 to it, that should be the rank of the result. And um, if you compute the integers from 0 to r minus 1, alpha and I O to R should be mutually inclusive. So for our example, R is 3, so I O to R is 0, 1, 2. And alpha in, in our example was 2, 1, 2, what was it? 2, 1, 2, 0, 1. So they should be mutually inclusive. alpha, epsilon, iota r, and vice versa. Now the uh, post conditions. Whoops. The, um, the rank of the result should be r. The shape of the result is what we computed on the previous slide. And then uh, a random element of, uh, random item of z 
should be the argument indexed by those same indices ordered by alpha. Okay, and then when when we run the example, it is uh, true. Like none of the assertions fail. In this case, uh, the assertions fully specify the result. This last assertion on the result is on the random element, a random item of the result, which means that uh, it fully specifies the result because it, if it's true on the random item is true on all the items, right? I mean, if you run the test repeatedly and, and each item has a non-zero probability of being picked, then if, you know, then you have fully specified the uh, result. So from that, I, uh, So again, I picked a, a random uh, index from according to the shape of uh, Z. You know, if you index by those ver uh, indices and compare it to the arguments selected by those indices ordered by X, it's true. And we we rewrite the indexing function using a functional form of uh, indexing so that we can apply it more easily to multiple indices. So Z itself is exactly uh, this expression. So from that, we derive a simpler, a very terse model of the transpose. We're just substituting or converting this expression into a lambda, lambda computation and substituting the expression we had for the shape of the result. Okay. Work on transpose has a long history in APL. The result shape was done in 1979 and the definition of transpose itself in 1987 and as recently as 2016. The current definition is uh, superior to the earlier ones and it derived by meditations on testing and by realizing that true on a random specimen means true for all. Now we're going to do some proofs. Now we prove uh, an efficient computation for the sum of the integers from 0 to n minus 1. So I order n are the integers from 0 to n minus 1. And the way we do proofs here is that an expression is equivalent to the, uh, to the expression immediately preceding it for the reason stated in the annotation. So you can go from one step to the next and it's true by the annotations if there is one. If it's too obvious, it, there may not be a um, annotation. So, according to legend, um, 
Gauss knew this uh, when he was a schoolboy. Sorry? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which brings up is a good intro to the next slide because Canoe says that uh, beware of bugs in the above code. I've only proven it correct, but not tried it. So obviously I've not tried the annotation on the previous slide. But here, because all the expressions are executable, you can type, in, type them into the uh, computer and check that at least they give the same result. And then avoid embarrassments such as <laughs> what Morton just pointed out. So that's pretty easy. How about something a little bit more complicated? So here's, uh, we're gonna invert a uh, uh, non-singular triangular matrix, which is a triangular square matrix. So we have a recursive algorithm for it here. And it's derived by inverting a two by two matrix of numbers, pretty easy. But uh, when we do the inversion of the two by two matrix of numbers, we avoid depending on the commutativity of multiplication. So now the next step is to use the code that you have for inverting a two by two matrix of numbers to invert a two by two conceptual two by two matrix of matrices, substituting um, matrix multiplication for scalar multiplication. So X is this plus dot times, which is the uh, matrix multiplication in APL. This, by the way, is a way to invert a triangular matrix in parallel, because you, you see it's, uh, you can, so here's the matrix A, B, 0, and D. You can invert A and D separately and then combine them together with B to get a, to get a inverse of the, uh, original matrix in parallel. Anyway, to prove that this algorithm is correct, we need to verify that the four block matrix equations are correct. Uh, the first one, you know, this. Yeah, so because it's a two by two matrix of matrices, there will be when you do the um, inner product, there'll be four possible entries, but they're block matrices. So, <coughs> and uh, you can verify that these steps are correct. The, the most complicated one is this, uh, let's see, C, the one that says C below. A, B times B, X, A, B in the product of B, X, D, I. And uh, you can satisfy yourself that uh, it does give zero. Now, uh, even more complicated version of the uh, a technique, you know, I'm given a square matrix M, which is Hermitian, and positive definite, and the 
Kolaski decomposition is to find a lower triangular matrix L uh, such that L in a product with the conjugate transpose of L gives you the original matrix. So L is a kind of square root of the uh, original matrix. This is not uh, special notation. Transpose is the thing we were looking at before. And monadic plus in APL is conjugate. So as for inverting a triangular matrix, we can do this uh, two by two technique. So this is the function we're applying to um, the original matrix. We divide it into a conceptual two by two matrix of uh, block matrices. And because the uh, matrix is um, Hermitian, that means uh, this uh, corner is the conjugate transpose of the upper right corner. And then we're saying that the algorithm summarizing this diagram is you know, the uh, zero, zero block is recursively uh, the function applied to the, uh, to the upper left corner. This is zero, and this is uh, T times our matrix product with L zero. And this is another recursive call, where T is this uh, matrix formed by the conjugate transpose of B times the inverse of A, matrix inverse of A. So to verify that the algorithm is correct, we need to uh, check these four block matrix equations. And also that uh, L, or the overall result matrix is lower triangular. Okay. First one is easy because it's true by induction or recursion. Next one is uh, uh, the symbols may be a bit foreign, but it's straightforward applications of matrix algebra and the definitions of the APL primitives. Again, each of these lines are executable APL uh, expressions, so you can enter them into the computer to at least check that they're kosher. And then, next one. is, uh, oh, this is an easy one because you get uh, equation C by applying conjugate transpose to both sides. And then finally, this is a bit more equation. He's, uh, I mean, I mean uh, longer steps in the proof. But again, this is straightforward applications of matrix algebra. Finally, we, uh, all four equations are checked out. We, we just need to uh, convince ourselves that L is lower triangular which it is by induction. Now if this uh, proof feels like a proof in math, it's because APL is executable math notation. Oh, I'm making good time. Okay. Next we're gonna look at uh, 
famous function, Ackermann's function, famous in computability theory. It has a simple definition in APL, and I think it's also simple in other languages as well. Uh, again, the left argument is alpha, and the right argument is omega. And the del, the symbol, indicates recursion. Okay. Uh, ACK is a very fast growing function. <coughs> we could, which you can see by fixing the left argument and then applying to uh, <coughs> a bunch of right arguments which you can do by using the each operator, which is like um, map, I believe, in other languages. <laughs> so I'm using zero, except I'm, I'm, I'm mapping a dyadic function, right? So is it a slight generalization of map? Because I'm doing dyadic functions, yeah. So it's applying each corresponding pairs of arguments. And when there's only one thing on the left, then it's applied to every element on the right. <coughs> so as you can see, when the left argument increases, the function grows more faster and faster. Uh, you notice I very cleverly didn't apply 4 at each to iOS 16 <laughs> because it would still be running. <laughs> it would still be running when the universe has turned to dust and the dust is gone. <laughs> so what's the pattern? Well, if you stare at it for a while, you can see the pattern. And the pattern is this. If, uh, if you have some function f, we don't know what yet, but if you have such a function f, and a act omega is f under through a plus on omega, I'll explain uh, all these in a bit, then if you increase the left argument by one, that is alpha plus one act omega, then it's the same function, power one plus omega under three with plus on one. Okay, so this is a very useful operator, under or dual operator where f under g is g inverse, Compose of f, compose of g on the argument. <coughs> so if the function, the function we're using under is three with plus, then the inverse would be negative three with plus, right? And power, the operator, is f composed with itself n times or n applications of f on the argument. And three jot plus is three with plus, or three curry, is it plus curry with three or three curry with plus? Anyway, it's plus with a fixed left argument of three. It's actually a very curious thing that this three with plus pops up in the Ackermann function, but it's, it seems to be uh, math mathematically necessary to have that. So now we're gonna prove the lemma. And you can, uh, 
So more notation. This, this is uh, not APL notation, but it's, uh, I think it's used in logic. It's uh, implication. It's saying that if this is true, then this is true. All right? And you can prove it by induction on the right argument. And it's, it's not really that hard if you just, um, you know, carry through the not APL notation. So it's uh, the steps progressed by straightforward applications of algebra and the definitions of the APL primitives. Now, in this case, we can't really uh, verify the steps if alpha is, you know, three, uh, no. If alpha is greater than two, actually, because the numbers get too large and it's not really executable. At least, but at least you can check it on the smaller alphas. So, So the lemma says that alpha plus one ack is a power function of alpha ack, basically, other than this three, you know, under three with plus. So what this is saying is, you know, what the lemma tells us is that zero ack is a successive function, and one ack is addition, 2 ack is multiplication, 3 ack is power, 4 ack is what they call a power tower. Is, um, reduction is fold, right? Fold, yes. So 4 ack is you're folding with, ex with the power function. So it grows pretty fast. And 5 ack is the power function of whatever that is. Okay. Um, come to the end. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think Haskell is uh, testing uh, utility. Um, John Hughes talked about that, and it was also mentioned this morning. <laughs> I think as long as it's as long as it's uh, possible for the randomization to select all possible uh, things in the universe, then it would be true for all things in the universe. Because you can you can see that since it has a non-zero probability of selecting each possible index. If you run this often enough, it will hit all of them, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not a practical thing, but it's good for thinking about it. Because I have an expression, you know, I have an expression which is true on a random index, right? which may take a long time to hit all possible indices if you actually run it on a large array. But as a thinking uh, tool, it's, use, it's very useful to realize that, oh, this is true for all possible indices. Is that right? Yeah? Okay, Aaron. Uh, yeah, the actual element of the result, which is Z.
That is true. That is true. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, typically when I test, I generate an uh, argument on random numbers over a large range. Okay. It, that's not a proof, but it's, you know, it's a good step towards that. And uh, as I said, you know, it's, it's also a good, good way of thinking about it. Sometimes you have to write your test so that it hits the, the special cases with higher probability. Otherwise, you, would, you may never hit that case. So for example, some, uh, some algorithms in Dialog APL kick in when the, when the size of the argument or the value is some particular value. If you just randomly run through the whole universe, you may very, very seldom hit that case. Morton. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, once you re realize that, you may um, you may do that. But I was. This is my usual step of writing tests. I'm picking random cases. Uh, yeah, except if your universe is huge, you may not be able to run through all of them at once. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, but once I realized that, I, this is exactly what I did. I, I run through all the indices, which is iota, rho, z. Okay, I think we're out of time, but I'm available for any other questions in the hallways. Thank you very much.